Good morning. We're going to talk about search in 2018, all of today, but I'll start off. In 2018, the landscape is changing. As our computers have evolved over the last decade, so have our phones. In fact, so much so that the latest iPhone X is just as fast as the latest MacBook that Apple has released. This means that all of our phones are now computers. We've moved from searching in Google, expecting 10 blue links, to searching in many, many more places. Sometimes we're not even aware anymore that we're triggering a, triggering a search by what we're doing. I search on my iPhone in Google Maps or in Apple Maps to know where I'm going or to find the nearest restaurant or gas station. My son and a lot of kids of his age, when they search for how to do something, they don't go to Google anymore. They go to YouTube instantly, expecting a movie. And in recent years, we've begun talking to our devices. While cooking, which I do a couple of days a week, I now exclusively set my timer through voice commands to my phone. This has become so natural to me that if someone else is in our house and sees me do it, they'll go, huh? Because a lot of people aren't used to it yet. While driving through the south of Spain just a few weeks ago with my wife and kids in the back, we were discussing things about Spain and I had Siri look up things like the crime rate and the side of cities. And this experience is slowly moving into homes around the world. Both Apple, Google, and Amazon are bringing out devices that you can talk to that are voice activated and listen to you all the time and can give you responses. I was recently in Munich for SE Oktoberfest, organized by my good friend Marcus here. And we were talking about this and there were about 25, 30 people in the room who had an Amazon Echo. They were all from the US. About 80% of them had used their Amazon Echo in the last week to order products from Amazon by voice. This is a drastic change from a couple of years ago. Voice search changes how people interact with search results. And because voice search changes that, voice search has already changed all of search. Not because we're suddenly all searching with our voices all the time, we're still typing most of the time, but not like this, but on our phones. But because all these um, companies are slowly getting ready for voice search. I'm hoping... What is Yostcon? According to Yoast, Yostcon is an interactive one-day conference focused on search engine optimization. That's Google telling you what Yostcon is just when you ask it on your phone. This is, in many ways, both in voice but also in look at it, what we'd call a singular result. Where SEO used to be optimizing for a place one to 10, we're now all striving for that single position because that's the only result people get for most of these searches. Voice and mobile search deeply impact keyword research. Roy will talk about that in his workshop later today, but there's a lot of things to keep in mind. It's not just because people search in phrases more than in keywords. It's also because they search while doing other things. They search while driving, they search while eating, they search while watching TV. And this is move has been going on for ages, but it's going ever faster now. And with it, Google is changing. Google has been talking about mobile first indexing for a good two years now. The basic idea behind mobile first indexing is we're changing the web from looking at pages as though they're pages on a desktop computer 
to looking at pages as though they're pages on your mobile phone. Now on well-built websites, like all of you probably have, this probably shouldn't be a problem. Because your mobile site will, should have the same content and the same quality as your normal website. But there will be tons of unforeseen consequences. And there will also be, knowing Google, lots and lots of bugs. There will be rolling out mobile-first indexing in 2018, probably in the first quarter, and we'll see probably some people well, be very mad because they've suddenly lost all their rankings. Of course, it shouldn't change all that much, but it is a major paradigm shift. And one thing you should also keep in mind is what Google is doing is very important. It's treating content within apps as similar to content on websites. So if you're searching on your mobile phone, it sends you straight into an app because it knows the content in that app. This doesn't work for all apps yet, but those who work on that can have a great advantage. Google is also using AI more and more in its ranking, something Marcus will talk about more this afternoon. And all of this changes how search results are calculated. Unlike voice search, this doesn't change how people interact with them. And funnily enough, this also means that for us, the advice we've been giving about how to optimize your website hasn't really changed all that much in the last 10 years. Because we've been optimizing for the end result, which is a good website for users. And Google has just been getting better at actually figuring out what a good website is. In many, in many ways, the changes that they've had in the last five years is, as Dave put it last night, very briefly and very succinct. They're finally doing what they said they would be doing 10 years ago. This means that content is still king. We've been working on our readability analysis for a, a lot of time now, and we've put more and more effort in that, and our readability analysis helps you write better content. That's the, the idea, content that's easier to understand. But you have to realize that in a world where algorithms look over your content all the time, content that's easier to understand is also easier to rank. Large sentences that are hard to read for normal people are very hard to grasp for algorithms. Readability has become an SEO factor, much more so than it was in the past. Of course, links still matter. R because ranking without links is really, really hard. And I see the SEOs in the room smile because I didn't say this. Gary Ilias of Google said this just last year. Google had been sort of denying that links mattered for quite a while because, well, they could do without it, and we all knew better. But then Gary came and finally, well, Give, it gave us the truth and said, yeah, we really need links. Which is when a friend of ours, Christoph Kemper, put this on a shirt, a shirt that Dixon, who's speaking later today, is kind enough to model for us on this slide. Now, if you know that link building is important, you know that there is a lot of aspects to that. In Silicon Valley, they had this idea of if you build it, they will come for the last decade or so. Meaning that if you built something cool, people would come to it automatically. That's bullshit. Let me give you an example. Earlier this year, I was in Iceland. I had been there 10 years ago. I was there this year for the same conference, the Reykjavik Internet Marketing Conference, and yes, that's a thing. Um, and we traveled through Iceland the day after the conference with the speakers. And Iceland is breathtakingly beautiful. It has enormous quantities of white, of drop-dead beautiful nature. This was taken at the top of a glacier. It's awesome. 10 years ago, Iceland was doing relatively okay. This was before all the crises. But it wasn't rich. 
And now, because of one hit series, Iceland's economy is doing better than ever. For those of you who've watched Game of Thrones, a lot of what you see on the, the north in Game of Thrones is Iceland. And Iceland has had four times the tourism it had before this series in the last few years. Iceland had been beautiful for millennia, yet nobody ever got there. It's not if you build it, they will come. It's if you tell them, they will come. Luckily, Laura, who I met in Iceland earlier this year, knows a thing or two about links, PR, and Game of Thrones. So she'll tell you more about that this afternoon. And with all of that, there's a lot of technical changes as well. So even though our advice on how to build good websites hasn't changed, Google keeps inventing new technologies. They've been pushing accelerated mobile pages, AMP, harder than I've seen them ever push anything before. They've invented a new form of HTML. They're reinventing the core layer of the web just to make the web faster. And to be honest, I didn't get it. I really didn't get why that was necessary. Until last year, we were in California, and we left one of the major cities, and I suddenly found out how slow the internet can be if you're not in Western Europe. It is really weird to suddenly experience that four kilobytes per second is actually a download speed that people still experience. Which means that the Yoast.com homepage would take about 50 seconds to load. Which is not something that we all find a good idea. So they're pushing this hard, and with it, they're also pushing uh, JSON LD, which is markup that gives them a lot of more information about pages. These two things together help you optimize what your pages look like in search results. And if you can stand out in search results, then more people click on you. It's as simple as that. So we'll play with it. Of course, site structure mistakes and other things that prevent good crawling can still really, really prevent your site from ranking altogether. Technical SEO has only become harder because a lot of developers have thought up new things to do with websites, and most of them are things that Google does not understand. That's why Dixon will talk about a lot of these things this afternoon. What's also very, very important in AMP is part of that is speed. Recently, we optimized Yoast.com. We worked with SiteGround, who are not only our gracious sponsors, but also host Yoast.com. We've been working very hard on our infrastructure, making Yoast.com pages load almost twice as fast. This doubled the amount of pages that Google visited on Yoast.com every day. And if you publish a lot of new content like we do, that's something that's very important. Now, this is weird to people because in many ways, when we talk in the, in the SEO industry, and even we at Joost.com talk about these things, we talk about something called crawl budget. As though Google can crawl 10 pages a day on that side, and 20 pages a day on that side, and 200,000 pages a day on that side. Google internally doesn't call it crawl budget. They call it host load. Which implies that they are thinking about how many machines within Google that site is allowed to use. And if, you're, if you make your site faster, it can crawl more pages in the same amount of time on that computer. So it's very simple. Make your sites faster. And if you're not doing it for Google, then do it for your users. Because it really, really helps. Now, we monitor all these things with a partner of ours, Wright, who used to be on page.org, founded by my good friend Marcus. Um, Marcus will talk, about more, we'll talk about that more this afternoon, I guess, but I, it would be good to, to mention them here. And if I'm mentioning them, there's a couple of other things I need to mention as well. In recent years, 
we've heard from people switching CMSs. Switching from Drupal to WordPress, or from Typo3 to WordPress, because they wanted to use Yoast SEO. Now, I love everybody who switches away from a proprietary CMS to an open source CMS, but we don't want to be the differentiating factor between open source CMSs. That's why in the last year, we released Yoast SEO for Typo3 and Yoast SEO for Magento, together with our friends at MaxServe who are here as well. We're hoping to do more of these for other open source CMSs so that we can cover all of them. And that's why a lot of our code has moved into languages that we can actually use on all those platforms. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that WordPress is not important to us anymore. Even though we have all these other things, 99.5% of our installs are still on WordPress. And why is that? Well, that's because we've got seven and a half million sites using Yoast SEO. 12% of the top one, one million sites in the world using Yoast SEO. When I look at those numbers, I get scared. Mostly get scared to do new releases. And we, we get scared because we know what can happen when we do releases wrong or when we change too much and people aren't aware of that. Well, WordPress is doing something even bigger. WordPress is bringing a whole new editing experience to WordPress called Gutenberg, because why pick small names? Gutenberg is in many ways an advancement of the WordPress editor into the modern age. It looks something like this, but it's changing all the time. And, well, I have my doubts about it. We also see that it has huge, huge opportunity. I've expressed those doubts, but we've also recently shown some screenshots of what we, are, what we want to do with it. And we've begun user testing and we've begun developing on Gutenberg itself. A large part of our development team is now looking at Gutenberg and some of our developers are working purely on Gutenberg and not on Yoast SEO. Because as Gandhi said, you have to be the change that you wish to see in the world. Now, all of this is fun, but we have to realize that SEO is just the beginning of the funnel. We're just the ones bringing people to the website. And after that, there's a lot of things that need to happen before someone actually buys your products. Which couldn't be more true, we've learned in the last year in working with Carl and the, and the rest of AG Consult, which sounds weirder in English than it does in Dutch, sorry. Um, all these disciplines really need to help each other. We've learned a lot from them. They, I hope, have learned a lot from us. And together, we're building that website that makes everyone buy all our stuff. For those of you who were at YoastCon two years ago, I talked about holistic SEO, and we still do. Funnily enough, I realized when I was making these slides that the term holistic SEO is a term I stole from Dixon Jones, who's speaking later today. Um, but this is still true, good links, great content, quality websites, quality accessible websites, which is why Rian and Andrea are talking about accessibility as well today, get you to higher rankings. It's not one of these three, you need all of them. That's why I hope today you will take notes on all of these topics, and by tomorrow, you'll start optimizing your website. I hope you enjoy Yoscon. So, Joost, thank you. And thank you for mentioning readability as a very <laughs> important factor. So, there's some time for questions, and we have this nice gimmick, which I'm going to throw now. And you can talk into it if you want to ask a question. This so. is called a catch box, and it's just bloody awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and it's very loud as well, so don't talk into it. Yeah, I don't know. Um, is there someone who wants to ask a question? 
And if, if not, I'll just keep on talking. <laughs> yeah, I see a question right there. Can you throw the catch box? Catch. <laughs> okay, I need to work on my throwing. Okay. <laughs> I'll be right back. <clears throat> if you don't expect people to be using your website on their phone, does it matter if your phone is or if your website is mobile ready? Yes. Because if your website is not mobile ready and is working poorly on the mobile phone, it simply won't rank anymore. So even if you're searching on a desktop, it won't rank? Yeah. But to be honest, nine times out of ten when people say I don't expect people to use my website on a phone, when we actually look at their analytics and look at how they're doing, people probably do look for that website or at least parts of it on a mobile phone. They look for your contact details or other stuff while driving. There's, there's always a reason to, uh, to do things on a mobile phone. So Google expects your site to work on a mobile phone before it does anything else. And even right now, if your website isn't performing well on mobile, it, it's already not ranking well in mobile. So if you look at your analytics and say, hey, we don't have a lot of visitors on mob from mobile, so we don't have to care about it, well, that's because Google is already discounting you. So that's the wrong way around of looking at it. Every website needs to be mobile friendly. There simply is no way around this anymore. Okay. Can I throw it back or? Well, Tim has it, so. <laughs> Any more questions? Here up front. <laughs> Good catch. Thank you. Uh, can you explain why um, uh, link building is still so important as many companies are, are uh, making uh, special websites for, for link building? And, uh, well, link building is important, but in in a good way. That's why we have Laura talking about it and maybe Dixon a bit talking about it. Link building can be done in, in various ways and buying links or building websites specifically to link to your website has been a bad idea for at least eight years now. So don't do that. Be creative, use PR, use social media marketing, use well, all these other methods that are out there. This is why we talk about holistic SEO, because we think SEO encompasses all these things. Or at least SEO should be kept in mind when you do all these things. And good PR in combination with good link building can get you much better links than building shitty websites that purely link to your site and don't do anything else. But link building per se is still a very good thing. It's the link building the crappy way that doesn't help anyone. Oh, throw it. <laughs> um, a question about voice search and uh, about multilingual websites. Is voice search only ready for English language or? No, it's not. Werkt het ook in andere talen? It definitely works in Dutch too. <laughs> Um, you can try. Install, if you have an iPhone, install the Google app. If you have an Android, it's already there. Talk to that thing. In fact, the funny thing is the demo I just gave of, uh, hey Google, what is YoastCon? That didn't work until three days ago. I tried it for 15 times on Monday. I had another demo in my presentation. I tried it for 15 times, it didn't work. I decided to try it again on Tuesday morning, and suddenly it had learned YoastCon and it got it right every single time. That's AI doing its work. It's t it needs some time, but it, at that point it got it. But it learns fast. And as more people are talking to their phones and to their devices, it learns even faster, because what it needs is a lot of voices. It needs to understand your accent, it needs to understand how you talk. And my English, as Dutch as it is, is very different from Dave's, who's a Nordener. And what you'll hear later on today, his accent is quite thick. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> but, I mean, for voice search to work, it has to learn all these things. 
And the AI can learn that very well. It needs enough input. And it's getting that in large, large amounts. But that's why all of these companies are pushing so hard with their devices, because the one who has the most data about voice will have the best voice search. Now, Google will always win because they have the best results, regardless of the rest in informational search. But Google is already losing the e-commerce space to Amazon. So yes, it will work in, in multiple languages. I think Google has an advantage there because it's in all these countries already, and Amazon is still not in Holland, which is something that surprises people when I tell them from outside of Europe all the time. More questions? The back. That was too. <laughs> all right. Um, Go ahead. You talk about the future of WordPress um, in term and uh, the, of the importance of speed on the load of your website. Um, how do you foresee the evolution of technology on how WordPress is built, um, PHP, and newer technologies are uh, rising that are more? There's a lot of discussion happening around that. And because we're on the live stream, I'll be very political and say that we will have all those discussions. Um, we, are, we have our ideas about what we want to do there. And come to my and Omar's session later this afternoon. We'll talk about that. Omar's our CTO. We'll definitely talk about the technical aspects of this as well. Um, there's a lot changing in the WordPress world. Um, and we are, I think, more aware than some other people that if we change a lot of stuff, that means that we're changing stuff for 28% of the web, which is a lot. So we have to be careful about that, and there's a lot of things happening there. But I would just like to get rid of simple things first, like PHP 5.2, which is a PHP version that was released um, years before most of our developers actually started high school. So there's a lot to do there, and um, it, it's fun times in the WordPress community. You can throw it right behind you if you want. Um, I have a question about uh, whether Yoast is going to be available for WordPress VIP websites. Um, we want to. Uh, we're working with them right now on uh, VIP Go. We're running some tests. Um, actually, the Jetpack team was in our office yesterday. Our relationships with Automatic are ever improving. Um, there's a lot of work there. Uh, historically, um, VIP had always had this rule of they had to look at every line of code in a plugin before it could run on VIP. We change hundreds of lines of code every other week. So there, there was a, well, a process problem there, more than anything else. Um, we're working around that now. VIP Go, we, we should be able to run Yoast SEO soon, uh, which means that we're, we'll be available for most people. Well, throw it somewhere. It's your pick. <laughs> Thank you. You mentioned that uh, all content should be available on mobile sites. Yeah. And before they used to say that you should hide certain content on a mobile site to make it faster. What's your opinion about that? Well, if you can hide it and it's not important enough, why are you showing it on your desktop site? So, I mean, that's it, really. If it's important, it needs to be there. If it's not important, leave it out. It's that simple. I think we have to move on, but uh, last question. One, one more question there. When will you be doing Joomla? When we find a partner suitable enough to, to do that. It's, uh, it's, uh, what, one of the things that we know is hard is that when we do a new platform, we actually bring quite a lot of users quite fast. So the partner that we work with has to be capable of doing that. It's one of the reasons we partnered with Write, for instance, was that they were capable of, of handling what we were sending them in terms of traffic. They, they're doing the, uh, the checks on whether a site is indexable. That means that they're doing a couple of million of those checks every day. That's not something that everyone can just do out of the box. And so for Joomla, we're, we're, we're definitely looking for a partner that's capable of handling what we need. And that means no small shops, but larger companies, because, well, it is a large thing that we're working on. 
The, the whole uh, MaxServe team here uh, is here and can probably tell you about how it is working with us, even though I hope they love it. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'll see you later today. And uh, good luck.